Okay, lecture three, beyond dominance. Uh, here we're going to look at the case when the dominant allele doesn't always override the recessive allele. So incomplete dominance is when the phenotypes of a heterozygote offspring are somewhere between the phenotypes of the two homozygote parental varieties. Uh, therefore, one trait does not completely dominate the other trait. And remember that this is during a heterozygous genotype. So an example could be seen in, in snapdragons or four o'clock flowers. Um, here you could see the gene for coloration represented by the capital C for the flower. And you have uh, big R, big R for a red flower. You have WW for the white flower. And when you cross uh, the gametes formed for the red flower, it would be capital C, capital R. And then it would be capital C, capital W for the white flower. And then the F1 generation there will result in all pink flowers because they're heterozygous CRCW. And then if you cross two F1 generations, you could see that you have uh, heterozygous flowers there. So it'll be CRCW, CRCW. And then you'd have one red flower with a CRCR genotype, two pink flowers with a CRCW genotype or one white flower with CWCW genotype. You could also illustrate this just using letters where you could use a big R to represent red and a little r to represent white and then a big R little r would represent pink. Um, so depending on uh, the level of genetics you might put that C in there to represent the color allele or you might just use a capital R and a lowercase r. Codominance is when two dominant alleles affect the phenotype in separate distinguishable ways. Uh, an example would be if you cross a black chicken with a white chicken, you end up with a speckled feather chicken coloration phenotypically that is a special scenario that we say ermanent. Um, in cows, if you cross a red cow with a white cow, uh, the codominant trait there would be a special case scenario where you create roan cows. And we'll do a cross with that where if you have a black chicken, big B, big B, cross with a white chicken, little B, little B, um, all the chickens in the F1 generation would be big B, little B, therefore they have black and white feathers or would be ermanent because of their heterozygous genotype. And we'll practice that in the class. Multiple alleles is when most genes have more than two allelic forms. Um, the best type of uh, uh, situation here would be blood typing. Um, blood typing is also a case of codominance because when you have uh, blood type IAIB uh, genotypically, your phenotype of blood would be AB blood. So, and we'll look at those. So the alleles for blood uh, are capital I, capital A, capital I, capital B, and lowercase i. And then your blood phenotypes could be A, B, or O. So if you have a type A blood, as seen here, uh, phenotypic blood of A would be capital I A, capital I A, or it could be capital I A, lowercase i. Both those allelic forms genotypically would give you a phenotype uh, A blood. For B, it would be capital I B, capital I B, or capital I B, lowercase i. That would phenotypically give you B blood type. And then capital I A, capital I B is just for, and here's where you can see that codominant trait, uh, blood type A, B phenotypically, and then two lowercase i's would be uh, blood type O. And we'll do a blood typing example in class. So blood typing is both an example of multiple alleles because you have more than one allelic form for the phenotypes, and it's a case of codominance as seen here in uh, blood type IAIB giving you AB blood. And then of course you have the the antibody antigens on the blood too or the RH factor. Um, we're not going to get into that in this class but you do need to know the the genotypes and the and for each of the allelic forms and the type of blood phenotypically that will be expressed based upon those alleles. Pleiotropy is when most genes have multiple phenotypic effects. Right, it occurs when the single mutant gene affects two or more distinct and seemingly unrelated traits. Uh, pleiotropy is responsible for multiple symptoms seen in heredity, such 
uh, diseases as cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, and Marfan syndrome uh, are due to uh, pleiotropic responses. Polygenic trait, poly in, meaning many genic genes, polygenic traits is when the phenotype is expressed by two or more sets of genes, or alleles in that case. Uh, so when you have many genes that play a role, and this is a lot of the uh, case for human genetic traits. Uh, human skin color, for example, is a polygenic trait where you have more than one uh, gene that plays a role in the coloration of the skin, the pigmentation of the skin. Uh, multifactorial traits are controlled by polygenes and they're subject to environmental influence. So an example that you would see here are in Siamese cats, uh, darker in color at the ears, nose, paws, and tails because the enzyme that plays a role, so that would be kind of an environmental influence, uh, the enzyme involved in the production of melanin, which would be the coloration, is active only at lower temperatures. So it would be these extremities, the ears, the nose, the paws, and the tail, that would be uh, at lower temperatures than for, say, around the body. And here you can see uh, the uh, fraction of progeny or children and the different allelic forms and genes for skin coloration. Epistasis. Epistasis is when a gene at one locus alters the phenotypic expression of a gene at a second locus. Locus, And when you talk about gene loci, that's where the genes are located. So you have a gene at one locus point on a chromosome affecting the phenotypic expression of a gene at another locus point. Um, a good example of this would be the fur coating in many rodents and mammals. Uh, pigment color gene, um, you could have black, brown, and then you could have another gene which states whether it be color or not. So if there is no color, then of course you'd have an albino organism. If there is color, then that color could be black or brown. So that particular gene, whether there's color or not, not color, would affect whether there is an albino organism or if that organism in the rodent will be black or brown. Um, common in mice and rats and other rodents. So here you could see uh, the example there. X-linked inheritance, or sex-linked. So when you talk about sex linkage, that means the traits are inherited via one of the sex chromosomes. So when you talk about inheritance from one of the chromosomes, pairs from 1 to 22 on, on humans, uh, that would be an autosomal disorder. And you could have autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive disorders based on, on dominant and recessiveness. But if it's found on the X or Y chromosome for humans, such as pair 23, where you have the X, X for female, X, Y for male, that would be a sex link trait. And an X link trait is used, uh, is basically when that gene is going to be carried on the X chromosome, but they're not, uh, not fully involved with the gender. So for example, uh, white eyes for the fruit fly is, is a sex link trait. It's carried on the X chromosome. So you could have a white-eyed male fly and a wild-type female fly, and we'll do that cross in class and illustrate what that would look like. Um, uh, human X-link disorders, are, sex link disorders include color blindness, uh, muscular dystrophy, adrenal leukodystrophy, as illustrated in the movie with Lorenzo. Um, that disorder was passed on from the mother. The mother was a carrier, but she, so it was sex-linked recessive. The mother was a carrier for the disease, but her son, uh, Lorenzo, did have it. And now that this whole new field of, of genetics opening up um, that it is really related to uh, nature and versus nurture, uh, epigenetics. So sometimes you have to go beyond the gene, above the gene, and look at conditions. And uh, sometimes the phenotype depends on the environment as much as it does the genes that are passed on and the genetic makeup of those genes. And an example of that would be hydrangea flowers. Um, basically, they have the same genotype range, but the flower color ranges, the phenotypic expression of those genes, can range from blue-violet to pink, depending on the soil acidity. So if we look here, we could see um, that purple-violet flower, blue-violet flower, would be in a more alkaline solution 
and the pinkish flower will be in a more acidic solution or soil environment. So sometimes it's not just about genetics, sometimes you have to look in the environmental conditions. Overall, an organism's phenotype includes its physical appearance, internal anatomy, physiology, and behavior. Phenotypes reflect the organism's overall genotype and unique environmental history. So, many human traits do follow Mendelian pattern of inheritance. However, basic Mendelian genetic endures the foundation of human genetics, so we typically say that humans are not good subjects for genetic research, but we have used animals in genetics to study and get a gr really good understanding of uh, the transfer of genes and, and a better understanding of what genetics is all about. When you talk about using uh, humans in studies and, and you're looking at traits being passed on from gen generation to generation, uh, you often talk about the inheritance of things through the family tree. Well, in genetics, a pedigree is a family tree that describes the interrelationships of parents and children across generations. So inheritance patterns of particular traits can be traced and described using pedigrees. So here you can see a pedigree for Widow's Peak. Um, dominant trait, Widow's Peak, to the recessive trait, have a no peak. Uh, the square boxes represent males. The uh, round buckets, uh, circles would represent uh, females. And we'll do pedigree analysis in class. Uh, you'll have a, a lab associated with that. So you could see um, Widow's Peak is present wherever they're, they're shaded in, and Widow's Peak is absent wherever it's uh, not shaded in. So the circles and squares that are not shaded in, there is no Widow's Peak. <clears throat> attached ear lobes. Uh, attached ear lobes is a recessive trait. So you could see again uh, where you have a, a attached ear lobes, it would be that homozygous recessive trait as it's passed on from generation to generation. And the uh, free earlobes are the homozygous dominant or the uh, heterozygous genotype. So pedigrees can be used to make predictions about future offspring using rules of statistics. And the rules of st statistics that apply to the multiplication and addition rules. Recessively inherited disorders. Many genetic disorders are inherited recessively, uh, homozygous recessive. Carriers have heterozygous genotypes, but are phenotypically normal. An example would be cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia. Inbreeding can increase the probability of the appearance of a genetic disease. Um, such matings are uh, consanguineous uh, mating behaviors. And some human disorders due to these are caused by dominant alleles, such as achondroplasia, which is a form of dwarfism that is lethal when the homozygous for the dominant allele, so you get that homozygous genotype, homozygous dominant genotype, uh, that could be a lethal form of dwarfism. And here you can see a, a person with uh, achondroplasia. Huntington's disease is a degenerative disease of the nervous system. Um, not obvious, phenotypically affects uh, until the age of 35 or 40. Um, many diseases such as heart disease and cancer have both genetic and environmental components. So how do you test for certain things? You could do genetic testing and counseling. Uh, genetic counselors uh, can do a pedigree analysis and look at the traits as they're passed down from generation to generation. For many diseases, tests are available that identify carriers and help define the odds more accurately, such as uh, fetal testing, such as amniocentesis, chronic VLI sampling, or CVS, ultrasounds, and fetal scopes. Newborn screening or tests are done on newly born babies to detect genetic disorders. Uh, here you can see amniocentesis, and we did a little bit of this when we are looking at chromosomal abnormalities. Um, where am amniotic fluid is withdrawn and the sample of the amniotic fluid can be taken uh, within 14 to 16 uh, weeks within the pregnancy and then you could do a biochemical test uh, to determine uh, cultured cells and, and cary karyotype those cells. Uh, the other one would be CVS or chronic VLI sampling where you take a, a sampling of the tissue 
uh, as early as eight to 10 weeks of pregnancy. 